Hello, I'm Robin. Welcome to my shop. Today we are going to look at uh, making linear ball cages for my Mitsui surface grinder rebuild. These are the x-axis, the long table travel balls that uh, the table sits on. These ride in hardened D2 V-way and flat-way rails that are bolted into the castings and in the back here we have the old um, cages and we'll take a look at those as we get zoomed in here and um, these cages were very simplistic I believe they were acrylic plastic and they um, brittle very few screw holes and just a very simple chamfer and a straight bore for how the, the to sit on the ball. This had a tendency to squeegee off and scrape off the lubrication uh, that we can see here and uh, just not an ideal situation. So we're going to show how I redesigned these, uh, added a few changes and uh, some of them are going from uh, acrylic to a, a Delrin material more screws, more smaller screws for a more uniform hold and some uh, features on how we are trying to get oil in here going from 27 balls in the original rail to 30 balls in the new rail so we're gaining three three balls more than 27 whatever percent that works out to uh, we're getting that much more uh, bearing capacity um, for the same loading stress on the on the balls and the races so a little bit stiffer and uh, we'll tear into uh, how we designed these and how we machined them. I don't think those cages were necessarily original Mitsui. They don't really look like uh, a very uh, high quality design or execution. But my main reason for making the cages other than the fact that they are broken and, and uh, I need to make new ones anyhow was to move from grease lubrication which is what they recommended with a three month interval of taking the table off and cleaning the grease out, putting fresh grease in, which is totally impractical, to uh, an oil level system where I'm going to fill the saddle, put a sight glass in and fill the saddle with oil where it just touches the bottom of the balls enough that the, as the balls roll, they'll carry oil up into the wick uh, section that I've got built into the cage and uh, the wick will carry the oil around to all, uh, all edges or all sides of the ball to um, lubricate the 45 degree section also. So you'll see that design aspect in the upcoming section. Here I've modeled my piece, which is 23 inches long by an inch high, extruded it 1 eighth of an inch thick, and uh, then I'm going to add the uh, fillets on the corner. I could have done those in the sketch also. Uh, but now we're going to come in and uh, do the actual design of the ball so we're going to switch our view here and look at the sketch of this so I modeled the ball the 5 8 ball my spacing off the end I have the center of the ball on the bottom edge and what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the cross section that I want to cut in this by revolving it around the center line of the ball here so that I get the um, actual pocket contours that I'm after I need something to sit on the ball itself so what I've done is I've put a, a point on the ball in line with this edge and set a ten thousandths gap for ending up with a twenty thousandths play up and down on the ball to be in there this gap is ten thousandths is to make sure that the oil that comes up through doesn't get squeegeed off by this edge and then this pocket is to hold the felt which is what I originally was thinking of putting in place there to um, wet the entire circumference of the ball regardless of where the oil got carried in so that's the cross section and just the power of using a sketch using points to um, establish the design that you're after so main thing here was to have some clearance this th this will actually sit on the ball this corner in use by gravity this will pull down and uh, obviously there's two halves of this I'm just modeling the top half and the bottom half is the same thing symmetrical mirror image of it and that will captivate the ball keep it from from falling out as a section view 
of what that contour looks like in the part and now I'm going to turn that off and we're going to look at that from the bottom and you can see what that pocket looks like but now we're going to turn on the um, the actual contour and this is where we designed to make sure that we weren't squeezing off oil where it uh, where it uh, needed to go I'm gonna look at the sketch that I did there and there I say okay I need this zone to be open this is going to get a cut here to allow the oil to come up on but I need an oil clearance where the 45 degree sides would hit so I thought well if I do one here at 45 degrees and model the pocket cutout and then I could just uh, rotate that around so that's what I did this was just to understand the spacing to get things where I wanted it so now we'll do that cut we'll slide down and activate the circular pattern and now you can see it at both ends here whichever way we're rolling oil can come up through this gap and but the wick the felt which what I was originally thinking I was going to use would carry this oil around and keep everything wet over here to the 45 degree point on both locations and the sides obviously which wouldn't function anyhow but that's the whole idea and then these edges right here are the only part that actually touches the ball and it doesn't touch where the um, actual paths of, of uh, the oil should be then we linear pattern that down the whole strip and um, we add our screw holes strategically in there and we've got our design so here I've done uh, just enough of a drawing to get the dimensions that I actually need for doing the milling and uh, drilling of this piece so uh, it's not a drawing that you would actually send out somewhere to get manufactured I just need the key features for me to be able to do the programming so uh, relatively simplistic and just has the, uh, the bare essentials. This is my block of wood that I intend to use clamped in the vices as my base and I'm going to fly cut it off. And this is the uh, black Delrin that the cages are gonna be made from. And what I'm checking here is uh, I have three different uh, transfer adhesives that are just adhesive there's no liner uh, my favorite 467 MP which works great 99% of the time very high bond uh, I'm not sure exactly which one this is uh, F9460 PC uh, that one I in my opinion doesn't work as good as this one this one is specifically for plastics uh, hard to, to adhere plastics and um, it does actually work really well like polyethylene and uh, things that typically things don't stick to this stuff's uh, really good I'm going to test these three pieces with a piece of each of these tapes uh, to see which one gives me the best bond to hold these while I mill the the contours I have my three samples here I have pressed them firmly against the wood for uh, a couple minutes in the vise I won't be having that situation when on the mill, but uh, for testing purposes to make this consistent, um, I, I press them on hard to give the adhesive a chance to bond. Most likely the wood is going to be the weak link on this uh, for multitude of reasons, uh, whatever natural oil contents in the wood or you name it. So uh, testing wise, if I lift it on this because the strip is from here to here, the actual adhesive strip there's it's only a half inch wide if I lift it here I'd be doing a peel test more or less because the um, the flex in the material the uh, plastic would bend and slowly pull here and start this edge and peel across by pushing down on this instead since I have a fulcrum that's relatively far away from the center line of the, the adhesive I'm gonna get more of a tensile test uh, of the glue which might be more representative and I'm going to put my uh, compression gauge or my uh, uh, yeah, force gauge in peak mode so it'll capture the peak and uh, I'm just going to press down on this gently holding giving it a little time to react because as we know these things fail kind of uh, progressively I'm just going to keep putting pressure on 
and the peak mode should record it. Might help if I turn the camera up where you can see it. Yes, that's me quivering, trying to push hard enough. Help! <laughs> you notice the, uh, that's, that's my force gauge saying, ah, that's all I can tan. That was, we maxed out on that. Okay, no, zero. And we're going to try the second one. Okay, 384 ounces, that's the very high bond tape and it looks like the, uh, yes, the, the adhesion to the plastic is what failed, so we're going to zero that out, and I'll come to the plastic bond tape. Three fifty. Okay. Like uh, like I said before, this four sixty seven MP seems to be the winner most of the time. So that's what I'm going to use. And obviously, for what I'm doing with a little eighth inch O flute, super sharp end mill, cutting around these things, this is all overkill. But uh, I'm going to use the four sixty seven MP. I'm going to apply the transfer tape to the plastic first, and I'm only going to put it for this 3 16 of an inch on either side here. I'm concerned that if I put full face tape down here that as the cutter goes through here that uh, is going to get a build up of that adhesive on the tip of the uh, cutter and just cause a mess and I don't think the forces are going to be that high that we're going to have any issues with just using the the two pieces. It'll make it easier to clean up also. But one of the things that's important in doing that is this solid edge has some burrs that aren't huge but they're probably enough to make the uh, tape not bond as well as it could as far as laying down flat on the uh, on the uh, wood so I'm taking a ceramic Noga scraper just beveling that edge all the way around before I put the tape on so thinking about how I could get this tape on here only 3 16 wide I said to myself if I space the pieces apart I have half inch wide tape I want 3 16ths on each side, that's 3 eighths for the two of them, leaving an eighth. Put an eighth inch dowel between these two, put them together, and then just take the tape and I will eyeball center it as I go down the row here, like this. I'll put this on and just visually try to stay centered here. I think anything in the ballpark is going to be good enough. trying to use my head here to make this go easier. Now that that's on there, I'll burnish this on so I know I've got a good adhesion here. Just take a blade and I'll get rid of my dowel pins so I don't run into them. They're stuck to the tape. There we go. Put this back down now and then just ride the edge of the part cutting the excess tape off.
Put her this way. There we have it. There's our two edges. And we'll just trade places like this and do it again. Gluing the strip down on the wood, drilling the holes for the tapped holes and the countersunk holes, milling the periphery, doing the pockets with the cutouts and the reliefs for the oil passage, and um, working our way down through there with clamps, and then finally peeling the strip off at the end and uh, getting ready to put another one on. So it turns out that I finished the ball cages, the 30 uh, ball ball cages, complete using the wood strip and uh, everything was fine. And as I'm posting on Instagram about making the cages, in the process of writing the comment, I had this thought, wait a minute, this is a V on V contact versus a V on flat and there's a distinct possibility that the number of balls should be different in those two cages to have the same deflection characteristics. So I mention that in the comment and then go start doing some calculations. And after uh, the third attempt, I finally get the calculation correct with some help of a uh, Instagram friend that uh, commented that I was doing part of the calculation wrong and making an initial blunder on my own that I caught. So third time was a charm and I'm just going to show a rough idea of what calculations are involved and then we're going to carry on where I realize okay I've got to make two more cages or well, two more pieces which is one cage for a different number of balls and I have a bunch of linear needle bearing cages I need to make for the vertical uh, slide of the Mitsui. So I need to make a better system for holding this thin stuff and doing the um, cage-like items like this. Better clamping system, better way of doing it in general than a, than a piece of wood stuck in the vise. So uh, I'm going to show you now the rough calculations and then the rest of the video is going to carry on with making the clamping system and then showing the actual similar procedures, same procedures I used for the wooden version except with the nicer, newer clamping system. So the table configuration that we have is 90 degree V's, hardened 90 degree V's. In the saddle it has two V's, the tabletop has a V and a flat. And they ride on these 5 8 diameter balls and that's what the cages are for to hold these in, in position. This is what jumped to mind as I was doing the Instagram post saying, wait a minute, it could be that the ball um, uh, since the deflection characteristics of this under load may be different, um, it may be that to make it be the same, you need a, a different number of balls in the rails. So what this boils down to is when you, uh, there are uh, calculations called Hertzian stress calculations, and part of those is uh, like when you press a ball onto a flat plane, or a ball on a ball, or a cylinder on a plane, all of those things have a calculation. They're not really complicated. Uh, you just not have to have your eyes glaze over and just do your pretty generic math to, to calculate them. But it's very handy to to know. And in this particular case, let's just take the the flat on the ball. That's the, the generic calculation. So you take whatever the load is that you're going to have on there, and there's a calculation that says for to pick the center of the ball, you put a certain amount of load on this plate. How much is is this? going to, to compress. How much is the ball going to deform into the plate? The ball is going to compress some. What's the approach, the normal approach of the center of the ball relative to the plane? With that calculation in mind, we have a different situation here where when you have the ball hitting on two sides and a, a vertical force, first of all you have to split the force in half because you have two places resisting it and then you have to convert the vertical force into the normal force and um, once you have that, then you get that normal approach, meaning how much more, do, how much closer does the ball get to this plane in this direction? And um, that was where I was making a mistake my second time. It turns out that it's the, um, in this case, cosine divided by the cosine of 45 degrees 
gives you the actual vertical approach. All of that basically is if we load this situation doing all those calculations for a given weight how much does this move these two move together same weight how much do these move together whatever that difference is we adjust the number of balls such that the um, total weight per ball increases or decreases whatever is necessary to get the total uh, deflection of these two systems the same for the same loading well it turns out that dropping to 27 balls on the V on V versus the 30 balls on the V on flat gives us a uniform deflection under load. So that's why we were turning around and making the 27 ball cages um, to make everything work out properly. And we're talking, you know, getting down into the to the you know five ten millionths or less variations here that we want this to to be predictable and how it behaves. Making up some new clamps. These on the left are Harbor Freight, which are pretty darn nice, and these are Vice Grip. They're almost identical, and what I'm doing here is I'm going to be grinding the uh, jaw pattern off of here, I'm going to be putting radius feet on the ends. I'm grinding the inside of the jaws smooth here. Just wanted you to notice one technique is you'll see as I'm pulling across there, I'm keeping an even spark pattern across almost the whole face of the belt so that the belt is being used all the way across, even though I'm traversing with a slight angle to it. Before after and you'll see why I want the thinner section when you see these in use. I'm parting off and radiusing with the file these pieces of half inch diameter Viscount 44 that will become the jaw pieces. That little uh, uh, stop set up there with the collet is very handy for this type of thing. I've surface ground these not because they need to be precise but by matching the widths, I'll be able to grab these in the vise together and do a group of them in one, one shot. Otherwise, they wouldn't, wouldn't tighten up evenly if they're not all the same thickness. Now, with them all the same thickness, I am able to mill them as a group and down to thickness. Now, I'm milling a slot that is just a little bit wider than the jaw that will keep these jaw pieces centered as I weld them to the tips of the pliers. I'm using an end mill that's a little bit smaller than necessary and then stepping over sideways using the digital on both of the slots. There's two pieces side by side shown there. Here we're milling the semicircle in half again leaving the quarter segment we're after. I'm using a 180 grit abrasive uh, nylon brush 6 inch diameter to deburr all those milled edges just to knock the the sharpness off. These do a really nice job, really handy to have around. Uh, a fine grit one in the uh, I think 320 range is also handy but the 180 really removes the burrs nicely. And through the magic of video, all those tips are welded on and uh, radius and ready to go. So what on earth would 3M strip caulk have to do with clamping? Well, this stuff is basically industrial snot. It's sticky as all get out and stays sticky unless you do something oily with it. So I have these pressure pads on here to distribute the... Uh, force of the clamps over the plastic and went some way that I didn't have to fumble around with holding the pad, placing it so I could move these around quickly as we're milling our way along. And I thought a lot of that on there would uh, work well because it's flexible uh, yet holds it in place and sure enough that's what it does. So it's pretty handy stuff around, to have around. Uh, works well for stopping leaks in you know coolant situations and creases and doors and whatever. 
where uh, you need to put some sealant that stays put but is still removable. Drilling starter holes for the square holes and then um, we're milling the holes square to the actual three-quarter size so that the brooch will only have to remove the uh, 5 30 second radius that's left in the corner from using a 5 16 end mill and part of that is so that the brooch can actually fit in and be aligned rotationally uh, square with the piece but also because the brooch is too long for my arbor press. One of the reasons I had to mill the rectangular hole instead of using the pilot that would be for this, number one, the pilot is bigger than the square. It's 13 16 pilot for a three-quarter uh, brooch. Uh, and this brooch is too long for the throat height of this, uh, this arbor press. So by milling the, the square a little bit bigger than the final size, it lets the brooch drop in far enough to be able to use this press. I just have some WD-40 on there. And that, that went that far because the uh, all this is really taking out is the 5.30 seconds corner radius that the left end mill left. Now we're getting a view of why this is uh, nice and universal because we have a virtually undisturbed clamping ledge full length to be able to grab parts and because of the holes we put in the back we can also pop through and grab from the other side if we need to leave one side open. So uh, these clamps you can see why the the design of those clamps are such that they can reach in and grab full distance and uh, that's that's why I designed it like that. They can open up to two inches, uh, but that's probably going to be pretty rare. Most of the stuff I'm going to do on here is going to be relatively thin. Here's the sacrificial strip that I'm putting on top of the fixture. It's 16th thick ABS hair cell finish. That's that uh, that finish there, and um, that finishes. At first I thought, oh, that's a stupid finish, and then I made some vacuum form parts and realized that that finish is awesome because it, uh, regardless of scratches and things, it um, leaves a nice looking part. So uh, on the back, I have uh, attached, I'm going to attach this to the aluminum semi-permanently with the uh, 467 MP. Um, still my favorite all-around uh, transfer adhesive and that's going to stick down and this is so that I can drill through my actual pieces my eighth inch thick Delrin pieces and uh, without uh, drilling into my aluminum plate I don't want this thing all peppered with holes unless it's absolutely necessary so this is going to the two strips on the outside here showed that previously on the wooden uh, fixture how I put those on uh, side by side these are going to hold down for the drilling and for the milling around the outside and with some clamp assist as we go around. One thing that's very important with transfer tapes or any tape is to uh, really burnish it down to get the intimate contact. Uh, these tapes, uh, some tapes when you actually look at the specs require a certain amount of PSI for a certain period of time before the actual adhesive strength uh, actually takes place. So just throwing these on, giving a quick rub with your finger is not the same thing as putting it on, burnishing it firmly so that all the air bubbles are out and it's intimately in contact with the part is uh, pretty important. Here's the fixture in place. I have my uh, sacrificial strip with my uh, uh, transfer tape on the back. I have dowel holes in here that are used for just aligning these strips. Uh, I have this currently what I'm working on these pieces are basically going to be about an inch wide uh, So I'm centering that I put some reference dowel pin holes in the back one on the end such as we put repetitive pieces in, we can repeat the position so I'm going to transfer tape down this uh, sacrificial strip and uh, use the dowel holes to uh, To support that So I'm going to Take off the backing strip, backing paper. Uh, 
I've, uh, I have already previously cleaned this with alcohol very well and I'm going to make sure I get up against my stops first, my reference pieces there, and get that down. And I have parallels already sitting here that I'm going to use to clamp this to get this to bond real well and using my uh, my special modified pliers here that you saw me uh, modifying the vice grips and in this case some seven of these are hazard fraught pliers and this is to really get that tape to bond well I don't want this sacrificial strip to move or to lift up when I peel the other ones. Okay, we'll let that sit a little bit, get some, uh, get some adhesion. Now that the strip is bonded down, the sacrificial strip, I'm degreasing the top of it because now I'm going to put down the Delrin, the actual part material, on top of this with, um, that has the uh, roughly 3 16 quarter inch wide strips down each side. So we're going to do the exact same thing again except uh, with the part material and as you can see here we have the two the two strips it's going to go face down and uh, it's just going to hold it on the sides while we do the periphery and the holes will do without uh, anything holding it down the periphery will do by holding it on the sides with the um, clamps in from either edge you'll go around part way pause and then uh, swip, flip the clamps over the other side and go down the other side. So now same procedure here. You have to be careful to get the corner started properly. Get up against this pin so I'm not warping my plastic as I push down. Getting in alongside and pressing down. Now I'll put those same clamps back, or strips back on, same um, parallels. And we'll put the clamps back on and clamp this clamp this tight again to get the um, get this to bond on the Delrin to the sacrificial strip adhesion. Now we're milling the outside periphery of the whole part and I'm moving the clamps as the uh, cutter gets past each section. I'm taking the cutter from the back or the clamps from the back to the front and just following around and then obviously once they're all moved the you can run down the back undisturbed and you can see why it was important to have those pads captive with the um, flexible material now I'm doing the same technique where we're milling the holes and the contours and the pockets by transferring the uh, clamps as we go just getting them out of the way in time and working our way down the whole the whole piece it's going relatively slow it's not really not like a panicky thing you can always hit feed hold to to move the clamps if necessary and we're at the end and now we're drilling the holes without any clamping whatsoever because there's hardly any loads on this and um, that doesn't require much force just using air to get the chips from tangling on the drill so we we don't want to put stress on the uh, tape that's holding this down to the plate now we're going to come up to this end I'm going to start under here and slide up right under this and 
This way I'm not stressing the either of the plastics. And there we are. We're ready to go and just rub off the adhesive. There's what it looks like. I'm here at the optical comparator. I have my 256 tap in here. And the reason I have it in here is I'm measuring the root diameter of the tap. So I've got my one root lined up with my cross here. I have my vertical indicator zeroed. And now I'm going to move to this one. See what the line is there. Come down to my uh, indicator here. It was 61.4, so 61 and a half thousandths diameter drill would be 100% thread, so a 16th drill would be fine. And the reason that I'm doing this is this is Delrin, and in plastics, there's no reason not to use 100% thread. The only reason we use less than 100% in uh, other materials is that the torque to drive the tap in steels and aluminums and things goes up dramatically, and there's not a huge uh, increase in strength from 75% to 100% thread. In the plastic, I think it will help a little bit, um, and that's the reason I'm doing it. I'm using my uh, floating torque uh, tapping head, which has adjustable torque, but I'm not using the torque here at all. I'm just using it for the floating aspect because this flexibility here will keep from ripping the threads out. If I tried to rigid tap this with the bridge port, which would be a common thing to do. The strength of the, it, it'd be very easy to just pull the threads out just from not following the lead. So I'm using this purely for this float aspect. Slide down to the next location. Line up. Lather, rinse, repeat. steel wool is the ideal deburring medium for this. Remember we don't want to have any embedded abrasive grit in these cages that would transfer to the uh, or scratch the grade 10 balls. So uh, that's why this is ideal. It doesn't leave any abrasive residue. Works good on any crispy plastic like Delrin, uh, PET, things like that. Not, not the best on super soft stuff like Teflon. but. Here's our 100 pour per inch reticulated foam. And what I'm looking for now is I'm taking my calipers and gently squeezing this till it gives me some resistance to see what its compressed height is without killing it, you know, smashing it to death, it, it responds. So 15 thousandths is a good number. That's how deep I'm going to make my, my cut lips on my die so that it presses it, the whole thing flat uh, in the process and then the pieces will just jump right out of there. So that's an important uh, number to, to know. Uh, if I made it shallower than that it would pro might damage the foam and permanently uh, impair it and uh, I might actually make it 20 just to be safe. So here's the die that I've made to cut this uh, reticulated foam ring of very very small cross section with a 5 8 ID and a 0 .705 OD. Uh, so it's very um, small cross section uh, wall thickness. And uh, I'll show a video of me actually machining this. This was a, just a pre-hardened, this was a test puck actually from a heat treat batch where I send a puck and say heat treat on the puck only so that you don't end up with uh, diamond indentations on your pieces. So that's, that's where this piece came from. So it was already hardened, and I just hard turned the uh, features of this. So my tool is into the 20 thousandths depth position from after facing it off. Now 
I'm going to touch that known diameter, that di diameter I've hard turned and I know it's 0.989. So I'm actually going to go in and I'm, I'm using the camera to see what I'm doing. And I'm going to touch until I just, just see some uh, fuzz from the, from the corner there. I'm actually watching right through the camera because it's the best view I've got. Right there. I just touched. Okay? I'm going to shut off. And right now, I'm going to set my X for that tool, 37, um, at 0.989. Now, what that means is that that 20,000 steps Wherever I go, the intersection of that front angle that's touching now and the face is going to be that diameter. So that's going to let me establish the ODs of my cutting lip. And right now, I'm going to go in and uh, actually cut those to size the ODs because for OD work, I have my tool a little below center uh, because it prefers that. Before I go and do the ID side, I'm going to get up a little above center because the tool prefers to be above center on the IDs. So that's why I'm doing the two ODs first. So now I'm going to set my digital at uh, X.705 because that's the OD of the um, uh, foam ring that I want. So I'm going to go ahead and cut right now. I'm just going to gently cut this. I'm going to go right in until I get to my I'm going to try to get the camera here to focus a little bit better. There we go. One thing I see people doing, I, I'm not saying they're wrong, but you don't need to have red chips when you're cutting with CBN tools. Uh, I typically run a lot slower surface footages than that, and tools last quite a long time. So there's the one. I just went to my diameter now pulling out. Okay. Now I'm going to set the uh, next inner diameter, which is going to be 0.625. All right, and that is not very far different. And I'm going to actually set that, and then I'm just going to plunge in on on uh, Z right here. I'm going to plunge into my depth, and I will have that inside correct right there. That's the spacing. That's how skinny that is on the face. Now, I'm going to raise a little bit on center height, just a trifle. Come in and touch on this known ID with the in other side of the tool. And, uh, get the tool here in view. I'm going to touch with this side of the tool now on the ID of this hole here, right there on this ID, which is known, that's 0.310. I'll go into my 20,000th depth and I'll come in until I just see chips on that. Set my uh, digital for what the ID is now because I've done both ODs. So, first I'm going to jack my center height up a little bit here. Just going to loosen up and give this a little twist. Um, now I'm ready to go. Okay, now I'm in at my 20,000th depth, and now I'm going to come in and I'm going to touch on the ID until I just get some chips on that edge. Now I'm just fairly carefully going to come in and touch here until I just see... There, right there. So now I'm going to turn off, I'm going to set my X at my .310. I think I might have cut just a little bit there, so I'm going to make it 311. Right, now I'm setting my digital to go to my 
same diameter, in this case 0 0.625, uh, 625, x 0.625, and my um, uh, z is 0 0.02, and we're going to go ahead and turn on, and now we're going to cut, cut out until we... Get chips out of the way here so you can see what's going on. There we go. Okay, but now I'm going to set my uh, 705, my X.705. And I'm coming into the other side of the the one that I did on the, the first OD that I turned, 705. I'm going to plunge into that to generate the outer, go into my depth. Now I've got those two edges, but now this is 3M strip caulk that I have on here just to hold this. I have a little pilot hole in the back of this to keep it centered on the dowel pin and that's so that it puts even pressure and this uh, piece can actually just move, tilt to center on the plate and have a uniform pressure. Part of what makes this work is compressing the foam all the way down first before it cuts. Those, those pieces or the um, ribs are only about 20 thousandths high and that's just about the compressed height of the foam where, it's, where it doesn't want to be compressed any further. So simple as that. Uh, works really nicely. Now I'm getting ready to load the articulated foam wicks into the actual seats where they go. And I'm going to load them first and then let the ball scoot down into the, to the hole. So I'll just march along and put all these in and I'll be back. Now I'm taking the 5 8 diameter grade 10 ball, dropping it in. I'm putting Velocite 10 now on these and you can see the reticulated foam wicking the oil all the way around the it actually looks dirty it looks uh, what you're seeing the black come through the oil and I'm actually amazed at how much oil they this, these actually hold it takes quite a bit of oil to saturate those so I think they're going to work really nicely here you can see the recess for the foam ring and then the little individual lips that leave room for the oil to smear on the, the uh, two contact areas, either the flat on the bottom or the 45 degree contact. Now I'm going to very carefully attempt to line this up and jiggle this in place and uh, oh, that just falls right on. Oh, That's one of the reasons why felt was several reasons why the felt was was no good uh, and there we have a completed cage this is the 30 ball cage no excuse me this is the 27 ball cage and we'll be putting the 30 ball cage together next these are getting bagged up to stay clean till assembly time 
Hope you found something useful or educational in this. And I'll be back.